All right, let's get back to our lesson. And uh, we're there in, in Ephesians chapter 5. Where the Bible says, verse 17, Be ye not, uh, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. This verse is very important. We, we pass over it usually in this passage, but I spent a whole lot of time on it. Uh, but God wants us to understand what His will is. He wants us to know what we're supposed to do. Um, many times believers think that God is hiding His will from them. I remember when I was in Bible college, guys are all, oh, I just I can't find the will of God. Now, it'll find you. And that's some of the things we're going to talk about. God is more interested in you doing His plan for your life than you and I are doing His plan. And uh, that's just the way it works. And so uh, we see there in point number one, what is the will of God? God has a plan and is a design for your life. We looked at several things regarding that. And uh, if you missed the other lessons, I would encourage you to go, to, especially to our YouTube channel, uh, to Trinidad Baptist Church. And then under playlist, this class has a playlist and all of the lessons are in order. So they're easy to find. Uh, God has a specific will. Uh, for every person and wants them to know it. We've got some verses there. We'll not review all of those. And, uh, and then uh, we talked uh, briefly about what the will of God is not. And I gave a little inc uh, incidents there uh, that I've actually heard people say something along these lines. Well, you know, well, I, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I ran out of gas in front of a Chinese restaurant and I took that as a sign that God wants me to be a missionary to China. No, that's not the will of God. Right? That's not how you find that out. But I've heard people make major life decisions on something that foolish. And, um, and so uh, that's not what the will of God. It's not coincidences. And it's not, and I don't have time to get into all of this today, but it's not even always opportunities. So, well, the, I have an opportunity. It must be the will of God. I'll give you a quick story. When our daughter Becky went to Bible college, and she went to one of these employment agencies trying to get a job. And she's got to work her way through college like all of us did. Amen. And uh, we didn't have any student loans. We worked our way through. We were done. We had no debt. Amen. Uh, but anyway, she goes there. She's trying to find a job. And she gets called one day. They want her to come be this office manager and come work at this place. And, and uh, so she shows up at this place to interview. It's a casino. A riverboat casino, because casinos are illegal in Illinois, but because it was on a riverboat that was permanently moored between two bridges and couldn't go anywhere, it was legal, and they wanted her to work there. Like, hey, yeah, that's not going to work. A Bible college student working at a casino, all right, number one, uh, that's against the rules of the college, but it's against the things of God. Now, there was an opportunity. It was a great job. Good money. That was not the will of God. So just because there's an opportunity does not mean that's God's plan. And we're going to look at some of these things this morning. Uh, we looked last week, much of God's will, point number four there and bottom of page two, much of God's will for every Christian is revealed in the Word of God. And uh, you know, if we do the things that we know we're supposed to do every day, things that are clearly defined and outlined in Scripture, those other items that are not clearly defined, like God does, you know, God, there's no verse in the Bible that told me to come be the associate pastor at Trident Baptist Church. And you won't find that verse in the Bible, all right? And, and God leads us in those things, but He doesn't lead us if we're not doing these things. Most of the will of God that we do day by day is already outlined in Scripture. There's a verse for it. And uh, my, my good friend, Dr. Joe Boyd, my mentor in the faith, uh, he said this, he said, why wait for a voice when you have a verse? There's so much of the Bible that, you know, I hear people say, well, you know, God didn't lead me. But if it's in his book, he led you, all right? You're just not following. So uh, there in, in uh, <clears throat> Joshua 1.8, read your Bible daily. We talked about that. We're not going to go back over those verses. Uh, we know we're supposed to pray, 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Uh, we're supposed to be faithful in church. That's Hebrews 10, 25. And uh, let's go now to 1 Corinthians 6. I think we touched on this one last week. 1 Corinthians 6. And we'll read these verses. Verses 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. Of course, chapter 6 in 1 Corinthians is an amazing chapter. And it deals with so much of, of the fact that our bodies do not belong to us. And that belongs to God. And so He has a right to tell us uh, what we can do and what we can't do. And um, 
Uh, man, I wish I could spend some more time in this chapter. We'll just look at verses 19 and 20. Where the Bible says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you're not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So we see here that we're supposed to live a life that glorifies God. We'll do that in our flesh. Now, when I teach those verses to the children, um, I did this recently here for a children's church. Um, I, uh, I, I read those verses. I'm going to talk a little bit about it. And then um, I had my daughter bring me in a Happy Meal. How many of you like Happy Meals? I still like Happy Meals. <laughs> I shouldn't, but I do. All right? And, uh, and so she brings me a Happy Meal, and the kids are all going crazy because they, they know what are in Happy Meals. It's, whoever came up with that, and by the way, McDonald's did not invent that. It was Burger Chef that invented that uh, in Ohio. But anyway, uh, with a little meal, with a little toy that didn't, you know, it's going to break before they get home. But kids would rather have that than go to a steakhouse. You get a little older, how many of you would rather have steak than a cheeseburger? Oh, yeah, yeah. And so... Uh, but anyway, they bring me the Happy Meal, and I open it up, and of course, I take a drink of my Dr. Pepper, because you have to have that, and, uh, and then I reach inside, and I pull out the cheeseburger, and I, I did this in children's church. I unwrapped that cheeseburger and started eating it. Kids are like, you can't do that. Like, I just did, and uh, there I reach in, I pull out the French fries, and, uh, and, and they, were, they were still pretty hot, and uh, so I'm eating the French fries, and then I started passing out French fries. The kids are going nuts. And I said, what else is in the Happy Meal? And, uh, and I pull out the little package of apples. I don't know how they keep those from turning brown. And I don't even know what chemicals are sprayed on those. Uh, but I open those up. You know, actually, I gave the package of, of apples away. And uh, what else is in there? And, uh, and they said, the toy. And I look in the box, turn the box, and there's no toy. I said, how many of you would be really upset? You go to McDonald's, get your Happy Meal, and there's no toy inside. They're like, oh, I want my toy. So why would you be upset? I paid for that. <laughs> yeah, you didn't get what you paid for. Look at our verse again. What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore... Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. God bought you. When you got saved, He purchased you from the slave market of sin. The question is, did God get what He paid for? The will of God is, I'm supposed to live my life that it pleases Him and gives Him glory. If I'm doing anything else, I'm not giving God what He paid for. So one of the things that, that is the revealed will of God I'm supposed to live a life that's holy and righteous and just and gives Him glory. And the book of James says, Be ye holy as I am holy. Uh, so we're supposed to live a life that we stay away from sin. Now, none of us are going to be sinless, but we can sin less. Amen? Amen. And, uh, and it's a daily battle. Paul dealt with it. Uh, so we know as part of the will of God, we're supposed to live holy. That means this week... I'm not supposed to do anything that would dishonor the name of the Lord. I'm supposed to live a life that's pleasing to Him. Let's uh, look at the next one there. If you'll go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. So if you're there in, in 1 Corinthians, just go to the right a little bit. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Look at verse, um, we'll start with verse 1. I've got verse 2 is, is the reference written down. And I realize 2 Timothy specifically is written to a preacher, uh, to Timothy, but it applies to all of us. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, I charge thee therefore before, the Lord Je before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So here Paul is instructing Timothy, you're supposed to use the Bible and and exhort to reprove or exhort um, reprove rebuke exhort with all long suffering and doctrine we're supposed to take the bible and talk to people about the things of god now we'll go to Ephesians, or acts chapter one a very clear verse about being a witness acts chapter one to give you the setting acts one is paul or i'm sorry jesus is with the disciples up on a mountain just outside of jerusalem he's been with them um, for 40 days since his resurrection, he's been teaching them the things of God. Uh, so then the book of Acts, you see in chapter 1, 
and verse number 8. He says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. What is a witness? Raise your hand if you know. What's a witness? They see something. You tell what you saw, what you know. Not what somebody else knows. That's called hearsay. But you tell what you know. These men had been with Jesus. They had been with Him for three and a half years. They knew what He had taught. They had seen Him be crucified and be buried. They saw Him after the resurrection. They could testify that this was the risen Christ. He's the one that died for our sins. He had saved them, and now they could tell somebody else. After you've been saved, you ought to tell somebody else you got saved. It's one of the best things we can do. Usually, what we like to do after somebody uh, gets saved, we like to have them tell somebody immediately. Hey, let me tell you what I just did. We did that for you when you first got saved just a few weeks ago. And uh, it's what, why, why do we do that? Because that's what the believer's supposed to do. I'm supposed to tell other people about the Lord Jesus Christ. If you got your books of Acts, just go back to, uh, go back to Matthew. So back to the left just a little bit, Matthew 28. All right, Matthew chapter 28, look at verse number 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. So here God is telling us, Jesus specifically was telling the disciples that I have all power, and He does, because He's God. And He says, now you're going to have that power, the whole, and that's what Acts was talking about, that the Spirit of God would come upon us. And He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. What is that talking about? Getting the gospel to everyone, and then baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So the command was, you're to take the gospel the story of Jesus coming to save sinners, and you take that to everywhere you can go. And when people accept that message, after they've been saved, the first commands are supposed to be baptized. So you do that. We do that here at church. We're ready to do it after every Sunday service. And then after that they're baptized, then you're to teach them. That's what this class is all about. That's what Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night is all about, is to teach them what God taught us. The job's not done just because somebody prays and trusts Christ. That's just the beginning. We're not done until they know what we know. We're to teach them. It says right there, to, uh, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. So we're to keep working with them, and that's why we have Sunday school classes. That's why we're in that Bible study. And, and so we are to be a witness. Uh, we just read these scriptures back in 2 Corinthians. Uh, we'll go to the next point there. Uh, as a believer... We're supposed to be married to a Christian. So if, you're, uh, if a person's not married and they get saved, uh, they should only consider marrying someone who is a believer. And um, we'll start there in verse number 14 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. As I said, we read that chapter a moment ago. 2 Corinthians 6. Where the Bible says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore come up from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Here's a principle that believers are only supposed to marry believers. Why? Because you serve two different masters. By the way, this same principle applies to going into business. As a saved man, I can't go in business with a lost man. You know, start a company and the other guy's lost and you're saved. You got two different directions. You're serving two different gods. And it's not going to work. Amen. And how many times have I heard people say, well, but I love them. It doesn't matter. You love whoever you hang around. You'll learn to love them. doesn't mean it's right. right? So these are 
spiritual principles. That verse Amos 3, 3, the Bible says, can two walk together except they be agreed. Uh, when when uh, I was in Bible college and I was single and looking for a wife, um, I was looking for somebody at college, at a Bible college. That's where I met my wife. And I'm not going to tell that whole story today. We'll leave that one alone. But I have help for you. I had to get a wife. I know how to do it. And uh, But anyway, um, when, you know, when, when I married somebody from the Bible college where I went, I knew what church she had come from. I knew her pastor. I knew who and what she was. I didn't have to worry about there were two different different backgrounds. Uh, how many times have we seen it? I don't know how many times I've knocked on the door and there's somebody that grew up a Baptist and they married a Catholic. That's not going to work. All right. Man, I wish I could spend some more time on that, but I've got to move on. Uh, Proverbs chapter 22. We just talked about things that are, that are clearly defined in the Word of God. And, uh, of course, we can, uh, we can spend weeks on any one of these. Proverbs 22. And verse, of course, that's right after the book of Psalms. So if you're new to your Bible, right about in the middle of Psalms, Proverbs is the next book over. Verse number 6, Proverbs 22 and verse number 6. Give you a minute to get there. Great verse here. The Bible says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22 and verse number 6. Now, let me just say this about that verse. That is not a promise. That's a principle. The Bible's not saying there, well, you take your kids to church when they're little, they'll always be a church. That's not what that's saying. What that's saying is you teach them the right principles, you teach them the things of God, you train up a child the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. What does that mean? He'll never be able to get away from what you taught him. I love the story told of John Newton. Anybody know who John Newton is? How many have ever heard the song Amazing Grace? He's the author. John Newton grew up uh, in, in the slave trade. He was a slave ship captain. His job was to take people from Africa to America, to England, as slaves. Horrible job. All right? He had grown up in church. His parents had taught him the things of God. His mother had taught him things of God. His dad was also a ship captain. But he'd grown up in, 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 when he was a young boy in church and learned the songs and new Bible verses. Got completely away from God. Was in that horrible lifestyle. Was transporting slaves. One day on one of those ships where he himself had become a captive. He was no longer the captain of the ship. His life was a wreck. And he remembered what his mother had taught him about the things of God and how much God loved him and about God's mercy and God's grace. And in the middle of that old ship, around all the slaves, he trusted Christ as his Savior. It was this principle coming to bear. He remembered what his mother taught him. Now, that doesn't mean every child is going to. But we as parents are supposed to train our children. My wife and I, we got married. We made it a priority. We were going to raise our children for God. They were always going to be in church. There was never a question, are we going to go to church today? That wasn't an option. <laughs> I grew up that way. Man, my dad's a preacher. My mom had been a missionary before she met dad. Uh, we never took a vote. Are we going to church today? Yeah, no, it didn't matter if you wanted to go or not. <laughs> I, when I was a kid, uh, and I'm sure you've heard a preacher say this, I had a drug problem. I didn't have a bad drug problem. I was drugged to Sunday school. I was drugged to church. I was drugged Monday, Sunday night to church and Wednesday night to church. And then my dad went into the ministry as an evangelist. We didn't go just Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We went Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, most of the day Saturday. You know, that's just where I grew up in church. It's the only place I've ever been, amen. Um, but the principle is, is we're to raise our children for God, not for the world. And uh, I've got to move on from that. We can't stay anymore on that. Uh, I want to, but I'm going to move on. Uh, go to Malachi chapter 3. So if you're there in Proverbs, just go to the right. If you get to the book of Matthew, you went one book too far. So back to the, word of Malachi, the book of Malachi. So go to Matthew, then back to the left one book, the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3.
Look at verse number 8. We'll start there. Malachi 3 and verse number 8. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing that there should not be room enough to receive it. Here's a principle that God is teaching Israel. He said you are to bring the tithe. The tithe is 10%. It's the first 10%. We will cover this in another lesson. And we're to bring that tithe where? To the storehouse. In that case, in the Old Testament, it would have been the, the temple or the tabernacle before the temple. In the New Testament, where is the, the storehouse? The local church. So we're to bring our tithes, our offerings, come here to the local church. And God says, if you do that, I will bless you. He said in verse number 9, if you don't do that, you're cursed with a curse. And he goes on to talk about how that, um, that when you live that way, when, you, when you're not tithing, that uh, said it's like putting your money in bags with holes. What happens? It falls out. Your money goes farther if you're tithing. So I can't live on 90%. You can if you give to God first. And uh, so that's a principle in the Word of God. You say, well, that's Old Testament. Yes, so, so is the Ten Commandments. So is creation. All right? But by the way, and we don't have time to go into all this. I think we've, we've talked about it a little bit in another lesson. And we'll probably come back to it again. But tithing started before the law was given to Moses. Abraham tithed. We see that. Pastor mentioned that on Wednesday night recently. Uh, and then they tithed, under, they tithed before the law, under the law. And then after the law, the New Testament, Jesus even talked about the Pharisees, the religious rulers. They tithed of every gift they got. People gave them gifts. They tithed of the gift. It was the last time you tithed on your birthday present. Yeah, that's what they did. And uh, when Jesus was talking about that, He said, This you ought to have done, the tithing, and not leave the other things undone, the other things of God that they were ignoring. And so the principle is it's, it's before the law, during the law, after the law. But in the New Testament, every area of the law that God highlights, what's expected under grace is more than what's expected under the law. So what do I mean by that? Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, when he was talking about if uh, thou shalt not kill, he said, you've read that, thou shalt not kill. It's Exodus chapter 20, part of the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> then Jesus said, if you hate your brother, you've already killed him in your heart, and you're guilty of murder. See, the ex expectation under the law is here, and under grace it's here. Um, he talks about um, in, in uh, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery. But then in Matthew 6, Jesus said, If you've looked on a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. So God is looking at even the intent is more than the act. So the expectation is higher in the New Testament. You get the book of 1 Corinthians. We've talked about this, how they gave of their poverty. They gave beyond their ability. And so it was way more than the tithe. And I wish I had no more time to talk about that, but we've got to move on to that. Um, go to Galatians chapter 1. So you're there in, in Malachi. Just go to the right. You get to the, the book of, um, uh, get to the book of Romans, then 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and then you get to the book of Galatians. So right after 2nd Corinthians. So again, we're looking at things that I don't have to wonder, am I supposed to do this? It's in the Bible. The verses are already there. I don't have to ask about it. Uh, Malachi chapter, I'm sorry, um, Gen, uh, Galatians chapter 1, and Paul was addressing these believers in the province of Galatia. Galatia was not a city like Corinth or, or Colossae that those books were addressed to. The Galatians is an area about the size of the state of Ohio. It was a large province into the Roman government. And he was writing to all these churches there. And he says in verse number 4, after he gives, you know, he, he's, he's praising the Lord for... for his salvation and so forth. Verse 4, he said, Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. So he's talking about how that not only are we saved and we're saved from our sins. Aren't you glad about that? We're saved from the penalty of our sins. It means I don't have to go to hell. But it's more than that. 
Some people look at Christ only as a fire escape from hell. But Jesus didn't come to save you from hell. He came to save you from your sin. And now he's talking about here that, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. You see, I'm not supposed to live like the world. I'm not supposed to live like, I mean, you look around our society, it's pretty easy to figure out we live in an evil day. We're, we're very much like in the days of Noah where the Bible says that the only imagination of his heart was only evil continually. Man, if you look at our society today, that's where we are. It's an evil, wicked place. All, people, all the people that are not saved, they think of nothing but wickedness. Things that 30 years ago, even the world knew was wrong. Now churches are doing. Things that you'd get arrested for 20 years ago are now expected behavior. Why? Because this world's evil. And God is telling us as a believer, one of the things that we're supposed to be, we're supposed to be different from the world. Go to 1 John chapter number 2. So keep going to the right. You get to the book of Revelation, you went just a little bit too far. So the book of 1 John, 1 John's right after 2 Peter. This is back in the back of your New Testament. 1 John, chapter number 2, look at verse number 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So God tells us right here, I'm not supposed to love the world. I'm not supposed to want to be in that system. We shouldn't desire what the world promotes. So we're not to, to love that. And then he says in verse 16, it's an interesting verse. He says, for all that is in the world. Now he defines, this is all the world has. The lust of the flesh. That's how this world lives. Whatever feels good, that's what I do. I want to do it, so I'm going to. The problem is many of us have, as believers, we live exactly that way. I want to sleep in today instead of going to church. Amen? You know, we, we, we do what we want to do. I found that the lust of the flesh. We do what we want to do. Um, guy decides he wants to go fishing, and he's going to go early in the morning. He doesn't even need an alarm clock to get up to go fishing. I am not a fisherman. But the blade horn is, I'm good at drowning worms and losing lures in the water. Just, it's just the way that works. I'm not a good fisherman. And uh, I've done it a lot, and I've not done a lot lately, but it's, it's, some guys love it. Um, I don't because I'm not good at it, amen? <laughs> but if I love those activities more than the things of God, my, my priority is at wreck. And that's what he's talking about here. Love not the world, neither things that are in the world. Um, he said... Um, all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the things that we see that we desire. I have a, a, uh, a little phrase I use that Brother Demp does not like. Brother Demp in our church, he's one of our deacons. He manages, he's the general manager of the Northwoods Mall. I said, you know what shopping malls are? They're temples of covetousness. And all this stuff you don't need, but they make it attractive. Uh, what's worse than that is the Cabela's catalog. Oh, yeah, there's lots of good stuff in there. I'm glad there's not one of those close, by the way. You know, i got to drive about two hours to get to one, all right? Uh, but we can pick your favorite store with all the stuff you like. And uh, you, know, you notice what the world does. It makes it all attractive, makes you want it. And that's what the world does. And the lust of the world, the lust of the eyes, that's what Satan did for Eve. He made the sin of rejecting the, the commands of God more attractive than obeying. And so that's what the world is. We're supposed to stay away from the Lord. I just realized we are out of time. We are four minutes past. Good night. How'd that happen? Well, Blade on, did you move that clock? Yep. Okay. Let's, uh, we're going to stop right there. Let's pray, and then uh, we'll get into the next service. Man, I wanted to go a little farther on that one. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the Scriptures, how that we can know how we're supposed to live. You gave us a book of instructions. I pray you'd help us to learn as believers to love your word and to live by it. I pray you'd help us in this next service. I pray you'd be with pastors as he speaks, with the choirs they sing. I pray that we'd see folks saved today in Jesus' name. Amen.